Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Daniel. I yeah, so hope you're all having a great evening. And as for Eric, well, I'm sure yesterday has been a hell of a day for him. And this morning, and well, I hope he's had a good rest. And I, yeah, I enjoy his talk too. I remember the first time he unveiled his website redesign. And just as everyone else, I was pretty impressed. And he, I remember he, I remember him publishing a post about how he did the background effects as well. So that was that was something good to learn from. And well, I should have known that he would use it as a as a topic for today. So, but just to be clear, I'm I'm not speaking today. Specifically because of Eric, but uh, I mean, we 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 know we all know that he's one of the big shots in CSS, and and yeah, he's very well respected and and all. But the you know, I'm I'm not here just for the clouds. I'm not just here to write on his coattails. I'm most the the real reason I'm here is because of. Because I switching said is the last top CSS, and I've been I've been attending this meetup for a couple of years now, and you know, uh, as I see here, I have a speech disability, so I I started out not really saying a word, and over time, as I got more comfortable, I started speaking to people. And that inspired me to to think, you know, maybe I could give this a try. Maybe I could give speaking a try. And Talk CSS seems like a good place to start because it's a small community. It's a local community, and it's CSS. You know, it's one of my favorite things. So, I only problem is I wasn't expecting the I wasn't expecting the meetup to this to be the last meetup ever and I'm still kind of bummed out about it. Then I first when I first heard the news last week I I was like, you know what? Yeah, let's do it. I'm gonna give a talk. And I kinda of scrambled to find a topic, but I think I finally found one. So in this talk I'll be introducing the new is and where CSS selectors and these uh, okay, so okay, so let me introduce myself a little bit first. Um, see. Yeah, so so my name is Daniel. My these are my pronouns. They them. In case you wanna tweet about me, <laughs> they them or he him is fine. You know, I'm I'm okay with either. So I was born and raised Singaporean, but my English CMI lah. CMI stands for cannot make it, you know. I mean, yeah, I did grow up in Singapore, but I my English is not so great. So I'm just gonna speak the way I normally do. So I got my start on the web learning HTML, and I learned it from new pets, and I was just eight years old. So even back then they had they had this little small little section where you could read it where they had a tutorial that would walk you through the basics of HTML, like the paragraphs, formatting, lists, that kind of stuff, and you could customize pages for your new pets. And that's where a lot of people my age started to explore our creativity. So so I think some of you here who are around my age range, I'm I'm actually 28 now, so it's kind of weird to think that I've known HTML for 20 years. So, so a few a number of you probably grew up around my time as well, so probably remember Neopets, and some of you might have gotten your start on there as well. 
but I only but I actually went with just HTML for about six years. I wasn't actively making websites, making my own websites for all six years, but it was only six years later that I started to take CSS seriously because I remember at the time when I first saw CSS, I was pretty daunted at having to learn a second language. So at 14 years old, when I did the first redesign of my site, I picked up CSS. So fast forward a few years later, I, I've been making, I haven't actually been doing this professionally. I've been doing it as a hobby all this time. And I didn't really dive deep into CSS and web development until a couple of years later when I was in, in college. And then I started getting active on Tag Overflow. And I've been, and I found my niche. I realized that CSS was my forte and I realized that I really enjoyed following the development of CSS and HTML and the web platform. And I really enjoyed explaining it to other developers as well. So answering their questions, getting reputation and Somehow I found myself pretty much leading these technologies on the site. So, so many of you who use Stack Overflow, have, chances are you've probably come across a couple of my answers on the site. So, and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the impact that I've had. I, yeah, pretty proud and at the same time humbled by it. And I'm a moderator there and Samuel, who has been attending Talk CSS quite regularly as well. He's another of the moderators. Yeah, and I believe John Clemens and Rob should be in the audience as well. Hi. Yeah, and uh, oh my, of course. Okay, never mind. I'll... I got a couple more shout outs actually, but I'll wait until the end of the talk to do that. So my contributions on Stack Overflow, along with the stuff that I've been coding on the side, didn't didn't go unnoticed by Microsoft. So as Hui Jing mentioned, I I was a Microsoft MVP and I was given the award in recognition of my contributions. So I was an MVP for three years and I and even prior to that I have been working closely with the Microsoft Edge team as well with the IE and Microsoft Edge team to improve the web platform, to improve their, their implementation, as well as to improve web standards for, for everyone. And I actually really support Microsoft on this front because they used to be, you know, they used to have this monopoly with Internet Explorer, but they've since changed their way and they're really embracing open source and the open web. And I started attending Talk CSS in 2018, yeah. So like Hui Jing, I love reading CSS specifications. They're not the most reader-friendly thing in the world, but personally, I really like understanding all the underlying theory of how CSS works from syntax to error handling to box model to media queries and all the mechanical stuff, as well as all the little edge cases of layout and all that. So a lot of my activity on Stack Overflow is mostly pertains to explaining the spec for others to understand, to understand how things work. So just a few of my favorite specs. I hope this is not too visually much, but syn syntax, you know, where all the passing and reading of the organization and stuff. Uh, conditional rules, which ties into, ties into another one. So there's media queries and supports feature queries. There's the really brand new nesting module that's derived from preprocessors. There's the cascade, because I find that, to be honest, a lot of developers, they misunderstand the cascade. They kind of hate the cascade. They think that it 
really works against them when really the cast I believe that the cascade is a friend, not your enemy. But that'll be for another time. And sorry to Flexbox users, I prefer grid. I of course I know that these are two different layout modes that have their own different users and you can even combine them together. You know, there's nothing stopping you from combining them. But I personally just prefer grids. So the next tier will be, you know, color, as Huiting mentioned. As Huiting mentioned, the color of the month is Rebecca Purple, and that's really, really significant, a really meaningful color. And, you know, actually, I do use Rebecca Purple in my site. In fact, in fact, I think I don't remember if I have any Rebecca Purple items in this presentation. We'll probably get to that. But I do use Rebecca Purple for things like highlighting on my website. Not not just because of Eric, but because not just because of Rebecca, but because purple is my favorite color. Yeah. And there's media queries, there's custom properties, CSS variables, and pseudo elements. And of course my number one, my specialty is in CSS selectors. I mean they're pretty simple. They just say which of these elements in the page do I want to select? What do I want to do with them? But there are a lot of different techniques you can use to match elements, applying a variety of conditions. And even though right now CSS3 selectors, they are not as powerful as they can be in selectors 4, they, there's still quite a fair bit you can do with them, even if you get into CSS hacks territory, CSS hacks territory. So let's talk about CSS selectors. So we recently, so if you've been following CSS news, you've probably heard of the recent East and where pseudo classes. So these are part of selectors level four, the latest working draft. But these selectors aren't as new as you might think. So a little bit of a history lesson, these, these selectors have been, have been wanted by developers for many, many, many years because everyone hates repeating, everyone hates repeating selectors because you have to, we'll, we'll get to an example later, but it's a, it's a problem that's faced by pretty much every CSS user for years and years and years. So somebody proposed a syntax that was friendly to the existing selector syntax in the form of a pseudo class called any. So this was back in 2008 and in the next couple of years, there will be some and the specific implementations by Mozilla and by WebKit. So these came in prefixes and they were used in their internal user agent style sheets. But because of the prefixes, you can't, you can't use them in production because you have to use both prefixes and that would mean repeating everything and that would you know, defeat the purpose altogether. So that's why you don't, you never see any in the wild. But later that year, the first public working job was like this fall came out and it showed up as matches. So the definition was the same. So it's a single pseudo class that matches one element, but it will match the element if it's if it satisfies any of these conditions. So if you put it next to like a type selector, you didn't have to repeat that type selector as many times as there were other alternatives. And this was unprefixed in Safari Night back in 2015. So 2015, that was five years ago. And Safari has had a number of selectors for features for five years. And things have been moving really slowly since, but things have been ramping up in recent years when in 2018, it was redefined as is and where. So why two selectors separately? We will get to that. We will get to that soon. And is and where finally landed in Firefox 78 and Safari 14. So Microsoft Edge and Google Chrome have implementations as well in Blink. But, but according to MDN, there's a little bit of buggy behavior. So they're still under the experimental flags right now. So you can't quite use it in production yet, but they're getting there and that's exciting for us developers. So what are these two selectors for? Put simply, when we have multiple selectors, especially when they get pretty long. Some portions need to be repeated multiple times to cover all bases. So 
like the diff example I mentioned, or in this case, here's one of the examples. So let's say we have uh, some heading elements, and we have headings of different levels, and each one of them has an ID. So you can use the ID to navigate to each section on the page using the URL fragment. And to highlight, to for example, highlight and highlight the heading text and color it differently, we can use the target pseudo class. So if we want to apply the same style to all four of these types of headings, we have to say h1 target, h2 target, h3 target, and h4 target. And you got to repeat the target four times. And that's kind of clunky. It works, but it's clunky. And But then when we consider something like a table, for example, if we have a table that has zebra striping, we want not only zebra striping of rows, but zebra striping of row groups. So each row group is represented by a separate T body element. And we want to apply a background color to the table heading and the table cell. So that's represented by the TH and TD elements. So when we when we want to apply zebra striping to every odd T body, we can see that we have to repeat this condition once for the TH and another time for the TD. And because we don't want to we don't want to mess up nesting tables, we can't use a single space as a descendant selector between the T body and the cell. We have to we have to chain it with a TR. And that makes it even longer. So is and where allow us to to reduce the number of times we write certain selectors. We it allows us to eliminate this repetition. So for example, with the headings, we only we, you can see here that we only need to write target once. And then we use the is pseudo class. And in the east of the class between the brackets we use, we specify the four different headings. So we attach a single east to the class to the target. You only need to use it once and it's all just one line. And this is much easier to read as well. And because these two pseudo classes are simple selectors, you can arrange them in any order. Type selectors always standing, but yeah, you can arrange them in any order. You could put the target after the is. But you know, I kind of like how it says target is h1, h2, h3, h4. As for the table example, here you can see that our th and td are consolidated into the is to the class. So with one is to the class, we only need to change this to one t body tr is either th td. And same with the zebra stripe with the end child odd. So this re really, really simplifies our table cell rules. So why do we have two pseudo classes? Why do we have an is and why do I have a where? Well, the difference is specificity. With the is pseudo class, specificity rules apply in normally with the exception that the is itself does not, does not count. Because if the is pseudo class counted, then then it will not actually it will not actually be a proper expansion of that. So if you if you look here, for example, if you had a preprocessor that had a hypothetical is pseudo class, what you would do is you might expand this into these four rules for use in current versions of browsers. And I believe the naive implementation of that in browsers themselves, it might look something like that as well. Of course, we don't we we don't know the full inner workings, the optimization that they might have, but that's how how you might think of it in theory. So if we if it, if this pseudo class counted, then then this expansion wouldn't work because you will have to factor in for this specificity. So to counteract that, it doesn't count. So with this diff example, we want a div that is either of this class or this ID. Or it can be both. But we have to satisfy at least one of these conditions to apply the styles. So the specificity is one ID for the bar, one class for the foo, and one type selector for the div. 
as for the where pseudo class, the where pseudo class has no specificity, so it's always zero. That means with our example here, if we change the is to where div where full bar, the specificity is only the div type selector. And this makes overriding arbitrary selectors easier. For example, if we have a series of uh, list styles with a link, a visited, a hover, a active, and let's say we want to apply a different style to to navigation links. So you might say something like that. Hey, I'm sorry that that's, I don't have a code example for this, but you can imagine that a nav a has less specificity because it doesn't have a zero class. So it would not be able to overwrite that. So using where with the links to the classes makes this easier to overwrite. But I do have a uh, more, I guess a more clinical example, but this example actually demonstrates what what exactly happens when you use either of these pseudo classes. So uh, in in an everyday use, you might you might use the cascade. You, know, you might just use the cascade as normal. And you might say, uh, color all paragraphs red, and after that, say, I want full and bar to be blue. You might place the p full and p bar at the bottom. So so then it, that little rule will overwrite the p, and because it's more specific as well. So with the is is a, is a Actually, for example, because of the more specific selectors, but with the where, you can see that even though I added these two class selectors, it's still being overridden by the general rule because these two classes don't count for specificity. So as a result, these two rules have equal specificity and the leader overrides the former. But what are the benefits of having these two pseudo classes anyway? So, I mean, besides repetition, what what was the benefit of eliminating this repetition? Why can't we just continue with our own way and continue what we've been doing for years and years and years? And why can we just continue to get frustrated and all that? Well, we've taken to using technology preprocessors such as SAS, and one of the feature, one of the most common features of preprocessors is to nest rules to reduce this selective repetition. And even nesting is being defined in another CSS spec, which I actually blocked about a few months back. Yeah. So, so is and where not only do they reduce this like the repetition like nesting rules does, but they also eliminate that nesting itself. For example, if we had this P full bar you or even the H H1, H2, H3, H4 target, you might say you might have a target rule and then a nested rule with all the heading elements, but that's like additional curly braces, additional indentation. It's just not necessary. So we can consolidate all that down into just an extra selector. And this improves readability and maintainability. So as you can, because you are able to see this is and where and say, oh, we are, we are looking for an element that matches any of these conditions. So a note on error handling, I yeah I was gonna cover this, but yeah. So uh, in in a CSS rule, in a normal CSS style rule, the normal thing that happens is when you have a a list of comma separated selectors, if any one of them is invalid or unsupported by your older browser, the whole rule becomes invalid. So developers exploited this behavior to create CSS hacks. So for example, some of the famous Internet Explorer hacks, for example, uh, HTML greater than body, something, something, something. This was to, this was to hide rules from IE6, which didn't support the child, which didn't support the child combinator greater than sign. And this worked very well, even if you had like longer like the list, because you just needed to use that hack once and you invalidate the whole rule and hide it from IE6. But the problem is that it, this behavior can work against us when we are not expecting it. And especially, 
and especially now that we're going to use is and where. For example, if we wanted to use a selector that we know is unsupported in some browsers, but we want to uh, we want to progressively enhance, for example. But this can this error handling can work against us because we can't progressively enhance because the rule just break entirely for all the browsers. So this was addressed by change to the specification. And the spec introduced this concept of forgiving selectors, which is, uh, or rather forgiving selector lists. So what happens with a forgiving selector list is that you have, you have multiple selectors and maybe one or two of them are unsupported or invalid. And even though a browser may not recognize them, it might, it would still, it will still, it will still try to match the rest of the selectors that it does understand. So the rule will still work, even in the presence of those unsupported selectors. So I, I didn't, I wasn't able to figure out how to do transitions for this, but yeah. So we have this, this example where we have a read-only attribute selector and the read-only pseudo class. Now this example isn't perfect because the read-only pseudo class has been around for quite some time, it's been well supported for quite some time, but this is just for demonstrating the, the error handling of these two pseudo classes. So even without the is pseudo class, if we have input read on, we if we have input read only attribute and input read only pseudo class, in browsers that didn't support the pseudo class, the whole rule will break. So you need to split them into two different rules and you need to repeat this color declaration in order for one for, for the old for the fallback rule to work. So what happens here is that in the original case, because this selector is not supported, it invalidates the whole rule. So with the new error handling, even if read-only is not supported in the browser, the read-only attribute selector will still work. And so the rule can still apply and the color decoration can still apply to the input element. And this saves having to split split the rule with an unsupported selector into two rules, therefore allowing you to really maximize the use of the benefits of is and where to reduce duplication. Uh, yeah, so so yeah, that's 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 about the introduction to to the is and where pseudo classes. I 